really just want to start with talking about a couple of these channels and what makes the combination so powerful. So if we talk about, let's say, email and SMS, which I know is a large focus of, of OmniSend's automation capabilities, yep. what makes this kind of combined approach so powerful? Is it just providing a surround sound effect for somebody from your marketing perspective, or is there something else in there that makes Omnichannel effective? Yeah, it, th so this is a really interesting kind of conversation. So if you're right, we're an email and SMS provider. We've got other tools and integrate with other things like Google ad platforms and stuff like that. But uh, I've been in email for 18 years, which is kind of crazy to think about it. <laughs> it dates me pretty well. Uh, but we've gone through this iteration of all these new things, email is dead, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And what we keep coming back to is email actually works really well. It's really consistent. It's still relatively low cost. And I, I think SMS is following that same path that email had followed early on. And that is it's ubiquitous in people's lives. And that is, it's hard to say, um, to really quantify, but everyone uses it. And as much as they would tell you, they don't use it. They still do. But it's become so much of a product discovery platform now. Now, uh, there are changes, right? Social media, it's ubiquitous in people's lives. Almost everyone is on some form of social media. You know you're going to get ads there. They can be really effective for you as well, generally higher cost. And there's other issues with that. But SMS is following that same path. Everyone texts now. Everyone is seeing value. And, hey, if you send me relevant content, regardless of what age you're in, it's relevant to the person. And I always give this story. The story is now two years old, but I think that quantifies it. My mother is a baby boomer. She will be, I'm not going to say, uh, <laughs> big birthday, big birthday coming up uh, yeah, in yeah. February. So I was visiting her uh, over Christmas break. Maybe I was up for a, a Bills game or something like that. And we're just kind of laying around on a Sunday afternoon. And like her phone starts dinging. And she hmm. starts reading the text out loud because that's what she does. And they're marketing messages. And I would have, she is not a technology adopter. She has them, but she's always a late comer. I would not have thought, and she hates shopping online too. And I would not have thought that she's getting marketing messages. And it was kind of this aha moment that SMS, because it's communication, it still fits in the people's lives. So you get email, which people are used to getting. They like getting them. It's a product discovery tool. Now you get this other tool that combines really well with it, that is also ubiquitous and people are now using as these channels. And I think just it's almost happenstance that the two things work together so well. And the kind of the thing that glues them together is they're both opt-in channels, right? So people have to explicitly say, yes, I wanna get these messages here. And that's why you see the performance so high. So you have that glue that ties these two things together, but really it is the fact that they're everyday people's lives. They're in front of them on their phones all the time. And it kind of works. It just works. Yeah. And it's a really long like, answer for you. Sean. No, that's it totally makes sense. And it, it <laughs> seems like they have a place throughout the funnel. Obviously, you're talking about they're both yeah. opt in channels, but the messaging and the activation for it goes well beyond just an initial, hey, you know, use this code or whatever. It can even be beyond becoming an initial customer coming back around. Um, and that might be imagine part of the reason why it can be so successful in using something like Omnisend um, throughout your entire customer journey. Yeah. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with offering code to someone to get them to come in, right? Sometimes they will opt in to get the code and they'll opt right out and that's okay, right? You get the customer and hopefully you build that, that relationship and they come back to you. Uh, but sometimes people just want the code. That's okay too but most people will see value in it. So you're right, it's a different stage of the funnel. You're not just gonna wake up one day and go, oh, I want I want to get emails from Greg's boot shop. Right. You don't know who Greg's, so there's work to do before to get that traffic over your site. And it is a stage in the funnel, but it's a stage that you can continue with that shopping journey kind of how you want to. So beyond the welcome message to browse abandonment, the cart abandonment, the post-purchase, the transactional, right, and you know, uh, you know, repurchase and re-engagement, like all these things that you can just filter in these different stages of the funnel. And then, you know, for some people, email is not their jam anymore, but SMS is, right? And that's where you pick it up. And some people want to get the quick messages on SMS. They still get the emails, but they'll get the emails when they're ready to shop. They get the SMS as kind of inspiration moments or flash sales, right? Something relevant to them. So 
very different stages, but you can continue through multiple stages and it goes with them where they want, which is going to help when you're out and about, you're hiking, you're shopping at Walmart or something, right? These things are all relevant for you at that point. So they kind of fit into your lifestyle pretty much anywhere you want to go. Yeah. And I, it feels like similarly, the, the evolution of the pop-up um, has grown to be where like previously yeah. it was just kind of the same thing plastered on a website for every single person arriving, <laughs> maybe a little bit of segmentation, but the future of that. And recently I spoke with somebody from Just Uno and they do hyper segmented and they're, they're chasing this like one-to-one -one targeted pop-up idea. And um, it seems like the similar sort of evolution is happening with emails and SMS where it's getting, we're getting better at um, proper segmentation and getting the right message to the right people at the right time. Is that something that OmniSend is sort of chasing after is that idea of better segmentation and working to get appropriate messages to the right people? Yeah, I think that's always the goal, right? So yeah. OmniSend, we've got a really robust segmentation engine. We pre-built recommended segments for you on things we know it work too. So our goal is to make email marketing and SMS marketing as easy as possible. So anyone from a solopreneur to an enterprise company can use its tools or what they need to. So if you look at, say, the solopreneur person, the one thing in, I always talk to people about segmentation is segmentation can be really simple and it can be really difficult and mm. it could fall anywhere in, in the middle. And if you're a solopreneur or maybe two people in your company, and you've got your hands in 20 different parts of the business, chances are segmentation is going to be difficult for you, at least on scale, right? So you're right. The, the goal is to find simple ways you can segment and make that sustainable. And what I say it can be hard, what I mean by that is you know, it takes time, even if it's five minutes to build an email, but it takes time. And if you have 10 segments and you're setting four times a week, you need either uh, really good dynamic content that already exists, or you need to cre like create 10 different emails to those audiences. And that's hard to scale. And that's what I mean by it. And when I was doing consulting, I worked with some really large brands that had like 10 people dedicated to email and they were really good at segment uh, segmenting, but even they were overwhelmed with how many messages they could do and how many people could code these things and how much dynamic content existed. And it's so much easier now then, but uh, that's the complexity with segmentation is it could be simple. You can use it effectively. Of course, we want to get there. We want to get companies to segment as much as possible. But the, I think the, the real goal is to find what are the simple ways I can segment that's going to have a meaningful impact on the recipient receiving the messages. And that's where you want to double down. And sometimes that's two segments and sometimes it's four. You know, but that's the goal is to figure out where it fits in your individual business and then work from there. Yeah. But I think and the ultimate goal, at the end of the day, you want to send the most relevant message possible to every single person. It's just hard, right? So where does uh, OmniSend fit into the picture here? Let's talk about that real quickly, kind of what the, the solutions are that, that OmniSend provides and how it's helping people sort of accomplish these, these uh, omni-channel goals. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, it's kind of that elevator pitch, but for, you know, we want to make email and SMS marketing as simple as possible, make it as easy to do as possible and as cheap as possible. So uh, if you build that into a product, things that we do are, we want to do provide any customer, free plan, paid plan, whatever. We want to provide them all the tools they can do to grow their business. And that's going to include things like segmentation. Is it available to you? Do you have are you limited with what you can do on there? Pre-built templates for those segments. So yeah, you want to start dabbling into it, pre-build those segments. We have pop-up forms. So pop-up forms are a good way to collect very basic segmentation info. You know, if yeah. you're selling based on the products, right? It could be, are you gift baskets, individual or business are you shopping for? Is it male or female on products? Right? What are you most interested in? It could be whatever you want. But you can collect those things on the pop-ups. Those are available. It's, it's all in the system. But that's going to feed into your automation. The automation is really where your bread and butter is at. So automation is available. We pre-build automation templates for you. You can customize them there, but get you in, get you out as quick as possible. But you can use all that segmentation information or those fields or whatever inside of that automation to say, okay, they selected mail. Let's send them a male dominated welcome message and we'll have female products. Maybe they're shopping for someone else, but female products recommended at the bottom and then vice versa. You could do click behavior. So 
that's kind of where it fits them from a high level, but the automation is really where a company is going to see the most value. So uh, you think about the core ones, it's going to be welcome message, browse abandonment, and card abandonment. Those are the three if any company is going to, you know, put a stake in the ground to drive the most revenue, get those three going. Um, so quick stat for you, Sean, we do these stats reports every year, right? So sure. last year, we sent out 23 billion marketing emails. So I've got the pleasure of going through that data, sorting it, sifting it, uh, which is actually fun for me. It's just, you know, time consuming, but uh, it's, it's fun to look at. So automation last year, 41% of all email sales came on automated messages and it was 2% of email sends across. So Mm. 2% of that 23 billion sends drove 40% of email sales. If you think about that, we see similar numbers with SMS. It was 26% to 13% of sends this year. I looked at Q1 numbers. And it was something like 22 to 6% or something, right? So automation, whether it's email, SMS, are really driving this, the stakes and driving the sales for companies. And the reason's simple. They're at high intense stages of their shopping journey. They sign up for your program. So one, they got you the site. Two, they got you interested. Three, they might, might be offered a code. They're ready to shop. Browse abandonment, online windows, like something in their life. They're on your website checking out products. Uh, card abandonment. No brainer. They've identified products. They just need a little push, whether it's, you know, a reminder or a discount, something. So if you follow the automation, the high intense stages, you're going to provide relevant content at the relevant time to the relevant, like the, the hyperbole, right? Right, yeah, customer, yeah. right time, right message, uh, right channel, right? So you can send an SMS or an email in that automation. And, and that's, that's kind of where you're going to, you know, you're going to find your success. So if you think about seg- you think about automation as a form of segmentation, because that's what it is, or one-off messages mm-hmm. that are relevant, it's a good way to kind of think about it. And then you can back your way into a full segmentation strategy. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I especially, I mean, you, meant, you called out solopreneurs and small entrepreneurs. There's yeah. a large portion or a really strong portion of the Lucky Orange audience are people who are smaller teams. They're, they're growing their brand. They're building out strategies for all these different channels. And it feels like the segmentation and automation, if you can nail that down, that takes yep. your small group and makes it much, much more powerful because you're always on and you're always paying attention to these people throughout the funnel with your automations. They're being hit in the right places at the right time. Would you have any advice for the smaller team who has started with segmentation and automation through these different channels regarding experimentation? So it's one thing to get started and, and you know, turn on the channel and start being present with yep. SMS and email. But it's a, it's a whole nother thing really to optimize it, air quotes, nothing's ever fully optimized, but to <laughs> chase automation, to chase optimization. Yep. What sort of tips would you give to a team that says, okay, we've started to use email and SMS in tandem. Now we're looking to optimize. How can people take that next step? So there's a couple of things I would do first, right? So. I'm going to presume you have a couple automations. So I'm going to go start with automation to work my way back. So I'm going to assume you have a couple automations. I think the easy place to start is to put those segments or some sort of segmentation options into your automated flows and test from there. So while you're figuring everything else, you're gathering data. Now, those messages, of course, will convert better because they're automated messages, but you just compare baselines versus those and can see, hey, you know what? If we do this segment over here, VIP customers versus, you know, non-customers mm-hmm. and we're getting this result what what could that indicate to us over on say a scheduled email campaign maybe speaking to those two customers my guess is it will matter but maybe that it doesn't matter for your particular audience based on your product maybe what matters more is focusing on the value ads and that you know that might indicate your your segmentation strategy so i would begin testing on the automations let the data come in while you figure the other stuff out as far as let's say scheduled campaigns or sms you know, you could try, say, segmenting your SMS with, hey, we have a, sec- a select group of SMS-only customers, and then we have SMS and email customers. So simple way, let's segment these two. Let's send campaigns out and see which one converts off SMS more, right? And you start to go that way. Do we need to speak to only SMS people a little bit differently than we speak to multiple channel people? Um, so that's a simple way to kind of figure out figure out what is kind of your direction for how you want to segment from there. I think the simple thing beyond that is to just look at purchase history. So 
zero purchases, right? You're probably going to have a low response rate on these things. You have one-time purchasers, which cool. We got to get two purchasers out of you to really start capturing the value of that particular customer. So what can we do to those one-time purchasers? And then whatever you classify as your loyal customers or VIPs or whatever you want to call them, frequent purchasers, right? Easy way to separate based on actual dollar sign, right? Yeah. And start going from there. And I think those things will be pretty telling to say, okay, we need to talk to these people a little bit differently. We don't, or we don't need to talk to these people differently. We just need to give them different messaging. So that's where I would kind of start. If you say got all that stuff done, I would then maybe look at, uh, I maybe look at like what they're engaging with from an email or uh, browse history, something like that, and say, okay, we've got past sweater purchasers. You know, we've got a new a new line coming in or a new product drop of sweaters. You might want to send it to everyone. Have two different sends go out. Send your sweater segments as one group so you can see the metrics there and send to your non-sweater people the other ones and then say, okay, do our non-sweater people care about sweaters? Or do our previous sweater people care about sweaters again. They already have sure. a sweater, right? Yeah. So I'd start looking at, like, these are pretty basic segments you can create, but they're going to tell you a lot about your overall program and your overall customer. From there, I think every brand can then choose a very specific thing that's relevant to them and say, okay, this is where we pour gas on the fire. How do we split this thing three different ways or two different ways and go from there? So, you know, it, it's kind of a broad answer because, you know, different products, different audiences, things like that. Sure. It's just activity, purchase activity, browse activity, stuff like that. How many channels they're on. Those are activities that will tell you a lot about your customer. And then you can fine tune from there. Uh, and then you know, I'll give you the co consultant's cop out because I used to be one. <laughs> no, you should test it, right? Right. So yeah. Test everything. But Totally. Uh, but yeah. Sometimes it's yeah, true. Yeah. And I, one, one of my favorite quotes, and my, my wife hates when I say this, but behavior is communication. And she's kind of like, well, what the hell does that mean? That's dumb. But really, like their behavior is communicating. Their behavior is communicating to you what they're interested in, what they're not interested in, what a segment's interested in. And I really like the idea of starting with broader segments and learning from that, giving it time and giving it sends and opens and clicks and seeing how it performs before trying to layer in what may or may not be noise. You know, if you say, we're going to add this filter to this segment, you might be missing on something that if you just held on for a second with the broader segment, you could pick up on what's really happening, the behavior that's actually happening. Um, yeah. It, it, so it's a really good point. I love the saying, by the way. So you can tell your wife that Greg agrees <laughs> with you. Uh, she'd be like, who? Yeah. So what I like about that is, you think about, let's talk about SMS for a second. So SMS, right? Most people are going to see that within a minute, unless they're in a meeting, but they'll see it pretty quickly mm -hmm. after that meeting is over. So whether they act on it, it's a different story. They're going to see it quickly. So SMS and flash sales, they make perfect sense, right? It's like match made in heaven. Hey, one hour, two hour flash sale, SMS only people. It's perfect. Now you could run flash sales all day long, but if you're not seeing anyone convert off that, maybe you shouldn't run flash sales. But take the purchasers of those flash sales, right? Those people might be more inclined to fear of missing out or senses of urgency or, uh, you know, kind of that uh, user generated content, right? They want to be in there. So if they are email subscribers as well, start testing your emails to them and maybe not flash sales. They say, okay, we know they purchased from flash sales before we got back in stock products. They're going to sell out again. They sold out before there's a sense of urgency in there. Send them a back in stock campaign and see how they perform versus other people. Uh, you know, maybe you do a, longer window flash sale on the email side, maybe it's 12 hours or something like that, but put more user generated content with five-star ratings and customer testimonials in those messages for those flash sale people and see if that messaging just gets people to shop a little bit more. So that's, again, it's taking one small piece of data from one channel and say, okay, how do we apply this to the other side? And you can do it from email to SMS as well, but like those are small things you can look at and go, okay, we got a segment of purchasers over here. There's a very, uh, you know, there is a, uh, like a trait there that they don't want to miss out. They want to be included. Let's apply this and let's push it and see if it's happenstance or let's see if there's something there to it. Yeah. Does the advice on segmentation and 
probably just SMS and email in general. Does the advice change if we're talking about higher ticket items? Um, does this, in your experience, play better with less expensive stuff in, in e-commerce, less expensive SKUs and average order values? Or does it does the rule of what we're talking about here really apply to the entire spectrum of, of prices? I, I think it applies to the entire spectrum. I think the nuances within that are going to be the different things, right? So higher ticket items, there's probably going to be a little more courtship involved, probably a longer buying process. So I'll buy a $40 pair of widget today. Mm-hmm. I'll buy a $2,000 widget maybe in a week and a half, right? I'm doing research and I'm shopping around and stuff like that. So I think the strategy and the overarching theme to it, to me, are the same. Right, you still want to send relevant content to the relevant person at the relevant time. You just might have more content for the bigger ticket items, or you might need more explanation, or more emails, or more SMS, or more touch points, whatever it might be. I think that's where the difference comes in, and that's where kind of knowing what works well, what your value props are, you know, what their buying concerns are, that's going to matter there a little bit. Yeah, and I think there's a there's something in there that makes me think about with segmentation. We, we talk about how Lucky Orange, the power of Lucky Orange can really be unlocked when you understand segmentation. I know we've been hitting on that a lot in this conversation, but it's so important. Understanding how to do that really unlocks the power of our tools. And a lot of people say, okay, well, where, how do I figure out what segments I should be monitoring? And really my kind of like standard thing is, well, what else are you paying attention to elsewhere in the business, your other channels? What else are you caring about? And they say, well, we're spending a lot of money on Facebook ads. Okay, well, that's that's a segment then. That's what you need to be paying attention mm-hmm. to. And so, you know, I think whether it's a high ticket item, low ticket, whatever, repeat purchasers are very common or uncommon. Where are you, what are you paying attention to in other areas of the business? When you're in a meeting and somebody's asking questions about a certain group of people, okay, well, let's translate that into the SMS and email campaigns. Yeah, so it's true. And I'm glad you mentioned the Facebook, right? So you talk about segments there. So one of the things that OmniSend does is we integrate with uh, Meta Properties and Google Ad Properties, right? So oh, cool. you have, say, someone that enters your card abandonment that workflow, right? You can add them to a segment that automatically syncs with your retargeting properties. And, you know, you don't need to pay the two bucks or whatever, the 50 cents to retarget that contact because you've got an email going out to them. So the Simple ways to kind of automate segmentation from that standpoint. I think the, uh, I was going to say something else too that you touched on. I'm like, oh, it's a great idea. I'll bring that up. And I'm old and I think I forgot that. So I'll probably remember in the mid- midway through the next question. But all good. Uh, yeah. All good. I do want to ask about regulations. Oh, I thought, um, I thought, go ahead. It. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm all over the place, Sean. I no, you're good. So, so you mentioned what else are you paying to in the paying attention to mm. in the business, mm-hmm. and talk. I, I gave the example before about simple segments, right? Did you purchase one time, two times, twelve times, whatever it might be? So some people will go, okay, for they're they're looking at simple segmentation. They're looking at dollar figures. So who has spent under fifty bucks? Who has spent between fifty and two hundred? Who has spent over two hundred? Talk about big ticket items here. If you're selling both, and you're only focused on the dollar amount. I go, okay, give me anyone who spent over $2,000 with us. And that person has made one purchase for $2,200 one time. You might go, oh, this is my VIP customer, right? But they might not have purchased in a year and a half It was that yeah. one ticket. And you've got someone over here that purchased four times and they've got $180. It's just a lower AOV. That person might be more important for you from yeah. across the board, more product reviews. So you said, what else are you paying attention to in the business? I would look at those things, right? Don't, you don't always have to cross lead the dollar, you know, the monetary figure with the purchase figure, but you do need to assess your price points, kind of understand the, the rest of the business there. Yeah. And I mean, those repeat purchasers might be more likely to give you some word of mouth love um, and yeah. paying attention to, to, to those growth strategies beyond just, you know, like you said, the purchase amount, specifically maybe regarding SMS email too, but on the regulatory side of things, the the landscape with SMS, phone calls and stuff also, but all that keeps shifting and evolving. And generally speaking, it's it's done in favor of the consumer um, and really trying to mm-hmm. protect the consumer. And I'm curious on your end, conversations that are happening or anything that's 
um, been going on lately that um, people need to be aware of or thinking about when they're entering, let's say they're starting SMS or they're trying to expand an email, what's some stuff they need to be keeping an eye on from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, I think as long as you choose a reputable provider, right, they're going to have yeah. all those safeguards kind of built in. So and the other aspect of that is I'm assuming you're collecting mobile numbers in a compliant way, right? You're not just harvesting <laughs> right, right. lists. So those two things I look at are a given. So if you're not doing one of those two things, you have a, either a provider that's not giving the options to dynamically or automatically insert that legal compliant text, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever into the messages you should find the new provider that does that now we obviously do that both on pop-up forms right you just drag over your compliance thing and choose gdpr tcpa whatever oh, cool. the compliance you want it's not make it pop that language in for you right nice same with sending right text stop to opt out from the regulatory standpoint you know they're going through and making sure that other companies that companies are following these things there's always new privacy protection laws coming in so i think there's a uh, there's an addition to the sms privacy or uh, compliance laws that go into effect in 2025 they pretty much say the things that reputable people do now you know <laughs> make it clear who the sender is coming from so if it's coming from a number uh, and this will depend on what country you're sending to so some countries allow your brand name others will show the phone number uh, us specifically so you know have your brand name in the SMS message, right? Full, whatever, first thing, Greg's boots. I don't know. I don't even wear boots, so here I am. But Greg's boots, you know, call yeah. in and I have your message in there. Compliant way to opt out. And the requirement is going to be that you had specific permission to message that person. So I, nothing really that I'm worried about from an SMS standpoint. It's always going to be a moving target, just kind of like email compliance is. Uh, but if you're doing things the right way, you shouldn't worry about this stuff. Yeah. Let, let somebody else worry about it. Sign up for OmniSend and let them worry about it. Um, That's what the lawyers are for. <laughs> yes. And let OmniSend worry, have their lawyers worry about it. When it comes to collecting phone numbers, I think a lot of people might be familiar with channels to collect email addresses. They're getting them yep. through ebook downloads, I guess is more of a B2B thing. But what are some ideas that you would have for people to start collecting phone numbers? Because obviously the strategy in the list is only powerful as the people that are on the list. So where can people start to, how can people start to think about collecting phone numbers to deploy for your SMS campaigns? Yeah, there's a few ways I would do this. So pop-ups, right? Yeah. I would add them to your pop-ups. Um, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter if it's a one-step or two-step form, right? I'll, I will give you the caveat in this, I, done a podcast episode on this like this was a part of the topic but drives me nuts personal pet peeve i'm sure it does everyone else too where it's like hey. uh, either the email and the sms the mobile number collection are on the same form right yeah and the sms is a required field and i'm like i just want the email <laughs> right maybe you'll opt into the sms a little bit later make the SMS, the mobile number an optional field always chances are you'll probably get people signing up uh, from a pretty good clip, but make it optional. If it's a one-step or two-step pop-up form, to me, it doesn't really matter, right? Put email address in, thank you. Also, join our text club, right? You can have the caveats there. I would, again, advise you not to make giving both on a two-step form a requirement to get the incentive you promised me and you showed me with only the email address box showing. I see it all the time. I get it all the time. Frustrates me to, to, to no belief. So, is Put it the pop-up form? Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, is the is the rationale that the the phone the SMS is more invasive, and so you want to make it optional for people, or is it is there something else there that you would say that why you'd make it optional? And I guess the the part B of my question that I was gonna actually ask when you brought this up was, you know, should people be choosing to ask for one or the other, and if so, how would they make that? choice is it de you know is it deploying a pop-up and you say hey we're going to go after these people with sms that's what we're asking for is as clear as that or is there something else where you would say ask for one or the other or one and make the other optional i i think it's a combination of things one people keep saying that sms is more personal and to some degree i'll agree with you but it's mm -hmm. also we see people we see companies drive just tons of sms signups right so 
I think people like getting messages from brands. And if it's too much, I'll opt out of it. But I think yeah. in general, if people like it, I think the one thing is people will give away email addresses nowadays, right? They're less protective of them like they are SMS to that degree. It's, it's been around for so long. So most people, when they get a pop-up, they expect an email address. They like to file it away, whatever. So I leave it optional because not everyone does want to get SMS messages. So if you're making it required, they might want to give you their email. And now you're missing out on both because they're just going to abandon the form. They're like, oh, not worth it to me. So I would collect one. I would def default to the email address and let the SMS people opt into it at that point. So that's why I say that. it's. Uh, you know, email addresses, I, I joke around, this is not true, but emails, are just, it's like fake money, right? They just throw them around everywhere. Right? Yeah, so yeah. yeah, give me give me your message. I, I want to shop, right? Give me the discount code or send me messages. I can tuck it away. I can look at it two days from now if I want to. I don't have to look at it today. SMS is not like that. So um, generally what you'll find then is people that want to get the SMS, they're going to be more engaged with your SMS program. They're the ones giving you the numbers. And the, that's what you want. You want the highest quality email address, highest quality uh, mobile number you possibly can to convert. So that's why I say it. So the pop-up is one. Just leave the mobile number optional. Other places I would do it, I put a, a secondary or tertiary call out at the bottom of all your emails. It could be at the mm -hmm. top as well. Join our SMS program. right? You can put dynamic content in there if you want. It just says, hey, if they're already signed up, you know, don't show it. To me, they're not going to really get upset if they see something at the very bottom of your email that says join the club. But it's an easy way to get people that maybe didn't want to opt in right away and they're trusting your brand now to look at that and go, okay, I can opt in here. So that's one way to do it as well. And then I would look at your transactional messages, order confirmation, shipping confirmations. So put call outs in there to sign up for uh, SMS programs because one, I don't know about you, I love getting text messages being like hey your order shipped it's going to be arrived tuesday hey it's totally. on delivery stuff like that yeah it, it's a great customer experience so you know if you can capture people after they purchase one you know where they're coming in from two you've got an, an, another touch point to get them and they're the purchasers like this is this is perfect right so it's a really good high intent place to capture uh mobile numbers as well and those are the three places i i think you're going to do most of your damage Right, right. Yeah. I think about my email inbox and I, I keep it pretty tight, but it still feels like it's kind of already my personal email address already kind of like too far <laughs> gone where I, you know, I'll unsubscribe from stuff every now and then. But for the, I see myself deleting messages from the same brands over and over again without unsubscribing. Whereas I feel like with an SMS that I get one, I know that if I hit, you know, no to stop message or whatever the opt out message is. It's so much easier to opt out and unsubscribe and know that I'm going to stop getting the SMS. It feels generally it feels harder to opt out an email. So I'm curious because I do the same thing, but I also have a separate email address for a reason uh, where mm -hmm. I just sign up for stuff. But that has turned into my purchasing email address now. So I am <laughs> between purchasing stuff and just a general uh, monitoring standpoint. But I'm curious by what you said there about, mm -hmm. hey, I don't opt out of the emails. I just keep deleting them, right? Mm -hmm. I'm curious because I do the same thing, but why do you do that? I will occasionally opt out when I have a moment of clarity and say, wow, I, I really am not going to go back to Pottery Barn anytime soon. I don't, I don't even know why I'm on this list of getting three messages a day about whatever, uh, Pottery Barn kids. So I just, I think from just an efficiency standpoint, I'll select you know, whatever's in view, if there's 25 messages and I don't want any part of any of them, it's easier for me to click delete than it is to go in and unsubscribe or right. opt out. And then sometimes, you know, and knowing running email on my end as well for Lucky Orange, I understand that there's different lists you have to opt out of at different points and unsubscribe from. And so it's not necessarily unsubscribing from everything. So it's kind of just being lazy um to, to delete as opposed to opt out and then again with, with the with the text message in general it just feels so simple if i get more marketing messages from somebody than i want or what it's an offer i'm not interested in anymore it feels so easy to to opt out there yeah so i've got two things there one i know why you get those emails your wife used the promo code uh -huh. wanted the promo code because they're hard to come by for that store right so truly uh, truly you signed up to get that promo code to make a second purchase 
Uh, second thing is, I, I think the balance between email and SMS is interesting here. And this is the one thing people never never talk about, but I think there's value to it is like, hey, I can I can opt out the SMS pretty easily. Right. It's just replying four letters back. Right. And mm -hmm. you could do that in two seconds. Email. What about the people that do opt out of email? Right. So like, like SMS can help replace those email unsubscribes. I can't talk to it. It's mm -hmm. awesome. So think about the user experience. So I'm a brand, Greg's Boots. I've got you, Sean. You've, you're an email and SMS subscriber. If you're only an email subscriber and you opt out, my next course of action is, okay, you're part of my lookalike audience on paid social now, right? And that's it. Like, I hope you come back to my site. You're going to get targeted with some ads. More expensive way to try to get a customer back. Now, if I've got your clone coming over and you're an email and SMS subscriber, you opt out of email. I've still got a opt-in channel, direct communication line with you. I've got all your history. I know what you're browsing. I know your purchase behavior. I can target you even with automation and keep that engagement going. And I, I'm not only relying on this. So sometimes one channel mm -hmm. feeds the other one and replaces the loss of that channel. And I think that's a really important point here. Is there no any... About it. Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting. Is there any reason why you would use SMS as a way to push people back into your email? Not, you know, not directly, but a as one of the goals of the SMS campaign is we think that we can get them to become a, a frequent purchaser or whatever through email. Or are you generally speaking okay to just say, okay, they're SMS only now. That's where we're living with them because that's where they want to hear from us. I think in general, it's going to be the latter. Hey, you chose email. It's not your thing. I'm content with that for now. But I think there are certain times of the year where you might be able to convert them. So if you're if you're getting our SMS still, there's some sort of a, a connection with our brand. Maybe it's passing. Yeah. Maybe it's I'll buy from you once every eight months when I need a present or something. But there's something there that you're not replying. Stop. Right. So I've got something. I think at busy times of the year, so you think about based on the, the type of brand and products you sell, but black like holiday shopping period, Q4, right? You might be signed up for the SMS just to get a promo code during Q4 that you're going to shop. Well, that's a really good time to try to get people back in the email. Hey, email gets early access to all our Black Friday deals. SMS theoretically should be the same as well. You know. Don't forget to come on back and sign up. And there might be certain points of the year where you can recapture them. But for the most part, I think if they, they opt out and you send them a reminder a month later, be like, hey, if you miss getting our emails, the answer is probably going to be no. Uh -huh. um, but there are certain <laughs> times where the answer might be yes, and you might be able to draw them back in. Yeah. Well, not to beat a dead horse, but back to segmentation. The people who opted into both and then opted out of one, yep. now you have a segment of people that you knew were formerly interested in your email, and maybe they get a different treatment through SMS. You know, we're, we're heading into the, we're already in the back half of 2024 here. And I'm curious on your end, what has you most excited? What has OmniSend most excited as we look through the rest of 2024? So uh, I'm really interested in the holiday shopping season. So, I mean, years ago, it was probably 10 years ago, I branded like, like it's not, it's not Black Friday anymore. It's like gray November, right? It's like <laughs> yeah. a gray November for a while. Now it's it's like early October. And I'm like, I don't even know what to call this stuff anymore, right? Opaque October. <laughs> but you know, we've still got we've still got high inflation in the country, um, and pretty much globally. So we are continuing to see shopping start early and earlier. It takes a little bit of a lull, but it's there and it goes through New Year's. And we do these Black Friday, Cyber Monday reports as well. So I'm sifting through and I'm looking, okay, where are the emails spiking compared to the year before and compared to the year before that? And last year we saw a second week or third week of October. So the beginning after the second week, they shot up and the sales shot up and it kind of stayed. And then November 1st rolled around and it jumped again. I'm super interested in how and why people are shopping early. And that's what really what I'm looking for. We saw a lot of SMS sales last year. I think our merchants did like 33 million in SMS only sales uh, last mm -hmm. year. And it didn't cannibalize the email side. So like that, that that's the thing that I'm looking forward to following the most. I think beyond that, 
you know, we're seeing more brands adopt automation. We're seeing cool things they're doing with them and how they're splitting. And those splits are kind of cool to me. It's what I used to get, like, I used to geek out on, on building complex workflows. And I'm seeing some companies do it now. And I'm like geeking out on doing on that. I'm like, oh, how do they have this split here for a brand? Yep. Card? They're filtering four different ways. And that stuff's cool to me. But uh, the Black Friday 7 Monday period to me is fascinating. And I'm curious should to see be, how it shakes out this year. Yeah, it should be an interesting one. Um, well, Greg, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your your wisdom and your ideas and strategies with us today. Where can people learn more about OmniSend? Where can people connect with you and follow along with everything that that you're talking about? Yeah, so OmniSend, pretty simple. OmniSend.com. You can Google us. Pretty much all the social handles are slash OmniSend. So feel free to check us out. Uh, always a call out for you. We do have uh, shameless plug, but 24-7 live support for all people, including free tiers. So, Amazing. Uh, if you want to sign up and just check it out, no credit card required, by the way. So if you want to sign up and just play around with it for a little bit, you can. Uh, but really good platform. It's got all the tools you need. We don't kind of keep stuff behind a locked door to make you upgrade. You'll upgrade when you're ready to grow. Um, so always call that out for you. To connect with me. I'm on mostly LinkedIn and X. I'm trying to filter out of X a little bit here. But um, if you misspell my name, it'll it'll correct you. So uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Ask me any questions. If you do send me a LinkedIn invite, please just let me know you heard me on the podcast. So I don't think there's some rando selling me something. <laughs> uh, but yeah. beyond that, like we're we're a super friendly company. We are customer funded. We love reaching out. So if you have a question about anything, reach out to any one of us on LinkedIn. Ask us what you want. And if we're not the person to answer, we'll put you in touch with that person. Super cool. Well, thank you so much, Greg. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Lucky Orange Show. Before we go, if you haven't tried Lucky Orange yet, head over to www.luckyorange.com for a free seven-day trial of our leading conversion rate optimization toolkit. What's in that toolkit? Well, let's start with session recordings and heat maps. With session recordings, you can watch a full playback of an entire visitor journey on your website, everywhere they click, scroll, move, everything they do in your site, a full playback. So you can see what's getting in the way of conversions and what is getting people over that finish line to convert. With dynamic heat maps, you can see the average visitor behavior on a page. So you can see clicks, moves, and scrolls. You can see how far down the page the average visitor is scrolling. And if something is below that line, that means that more than 50% of visitors are not seeing that. Lucky Orange also offers tools like live chat, announcements, and surveys so that you can communicate with your website visitors in real time. So again, if you have not tried Lucky Orange or if you're not a user yet, head over to luckyorange.com, check it out, seven day free trial with no credit card required. If you're a Shopify store owner, head over to the Shopify app store to download the Lucky Orange app to your store today, as well as BigCommerce, HubSpot, Square, and many more. Check us out and happy optimizing.